Hi guitarlings, I'm Gray and this is Hub Guitar. Today we're going to learn a very popular Bach cello piece that you may have heard before. Now you've, pr you've probably heard this on cello, but of course it can also be played on guitar. That's what we'll be working on today. You can play this with your fingers. You can also play it with a pick, although if you play it with a pick, um, the technique involved is considerably more challenging, so there's a bit of a trade-off there. Um, I think it sounds very good with the fingers, although there are some very fast single note runs up and down single strings that are also really fun to play with a pick. So you can learn it either way. Let's begin. Starting on measure one, we've just got a D chord. The arc over the, the two and the zero indicates a pull off. And then above the staff, you'll see some suggested picking patterns. So down, up, up, pull off, up, down, up, down. Of course, by default, you can do alternate picking in any case, but this is just a suggestion for you um, if you find that the, the pure down up alternate picking pattern is not working or is not accurate. There are ways that you can um, address that. So in general, you wanna be using strict alternate picking or if you are making an exception to that, such as reversing the alternate picking pattern or doing something like that, you kinda of wanna think about it and know why. And then it's handy to print out your sheet music and then write above each note what your picking pattern is. It might sound tedious, but that's how advanced guitar players get that way. They put some thought into how they play every note rather than just sort of letting their, their intuitive subconscious decide for them. In measure two, we've got a G chord, very similar pattern as measure one, and we're gonna use the pull off there as well. And in measure three, more of a dominant sound, and then back to the D major chord for measure four. And now in measure five, we start doing some of the fast runs. So if you're playing this with your fingers, you want to have a good strategy for playing, especially those notes that, that rapidly alternate across a single string. You generally wouldn't want to use a single finger. That would feel pretty clumsy. So you want to kind of alternate between at least two fingers, your index and your middle. And of course, if you're going to use the pick, you just alternate pick it. At a measure six, we've got this nice chord. And to measure seven. So at the end of measure seven, you'll see this little indicator for a bar chord across the second fret. That's kind of a heads up that at measure eight, we're going to a bar chord pattern. So if you set that bar up on the last beat of measure seven, you'll be much better off when you get to measure eight. Because your index finger is already barring across the second fret. So sometimes it seems like it's easier to use open strings because open strings are easy. But if they sort of prohibit you from getting a bar in place that needs to be there, they can paradoxically make the thing more clumsy or harder to play. So you can look at that and decide if you want to uh, maybe use some open strings or if you want to use the um, the notes at the second fret. So for the B note, which is the second to last note of this measure, you could do an open B there, or you could do the B on the fourth fret of the third string. And uh, it seems easier to do an open string normally, but in this case, I think paradoxically, if you try to do the open string, it'll actually make it harder to get that bar in place. So it's not always necessarily easier to play open strings. So you've got to compare the options and decide what's best for you. Now we're in measure eight for a B minor chord. Note that that's of course best accomplished with a bar pattern. There might be some way to do it without a bar chord, but it's just gonna make it a lot harder. So if you're having trouble getting the strength, uh, really work on practicing those bar chords and building up that fretting hand strength. In measure nine, we go back to those single notes. Ten. 
that's important if you're going to, especially if you're going to do open strings. Um, but in general, whenever you've got a note that's ringing on another string, you don't want to screw it up as you as you make your dive to the, the following note. So when you play those, like for example, on the tenth measure, two to open, and then the second fret on the third string. I don't want to kill that open string prematurely as I move my way to the next note on the third string. I want to try to let it have its full length. Now you can also sort of, if you see an opportunity, you can use hammer-ons and pull-offs. Usually performers, you know, professional musicians will be considering the style when they make those decisions and how to interpret the tune. And uh, they'll also consider things like the period, you know, when was this written and how was, how did people, how did contemporaries in that period of time uh, approach this kind of performance. But if you're not trying to be historically accurate or, you know, play at Symphony Hall, I think you can exercise a little bit of creative license of your own there. Now we're at measure 11. So you can see this sort of drone or this repeating tendency to come back to the second fret of the third string. So we want to just keep a finger there the whole time. That's going to make the whole passage quite a bit more ergonomic. If you've got your second or middle finger on the second fret of the third string, it's going to be a lot more ergonomic. Uh, sometimes I did lift it up a little bit, but for the most part I tried to keep it there. That makes it a little bit easier to play. On to measure 12. 13, there's a little chord there. And back to those nice uh, Bach runs. I like that little run. Again, try to use some alternation when you do that. So you might use middle, index, middle, index, middle, index, etc. You get back to 15, you go back into a chord shape. And that's nice because each finger can take responsibility for plucking a string. So when you see something like this, where notes aren't changing within the measure, you can pretty much assume this is a chord shape and it's gonna be much more ergonomic if you can get all of those notes fretted cleanly together as if they were a chord, which they are. Now we're at measure 16 with more of that idea, that motif, uh, this time on a new chord. If you're going to execute that 5 to 4 as a pull off, then it would benefit you to fret um, 5, 4, 4. So I've got my index finger on the 4th fret of the 3rd and 4th string. And then I'm using my middle finger on the 5th fret of the 5th string. And then I'm putting my ring finger on the 5th fret of the 3rd string. And that way I can quickly cycle back and forth between those notes. Measure 17 is pretty straightforward. Measure 18, and measure 19 with another nice run. So now we're on measure 20, and uh, you'll probably notice, wow, you know, this chord is quite a bit harder than most of the other chords that have shown up. This chord is uh, showing up on measure 20. There's like 42 measures in this tune, so it's like one out of 42 measures has a fairly difficult chord. And if that measure gets the proportion of practice equivalent to its actual amount of stage time, if you will, then it will never sound good. So when you encounter a difficult chord or a difficult passage, you've got to isolate it and do it a lot of times. I highly recommend the discipline that I call chord push-ups. If you play that chord, some variation of it and then just lift up your hand and do that maybe I don't know maybe like a thousand times to do it maybe two thousand whatever whatever feels right for you um, but maybe for starters at least a hundred you know make a note of it make a uh, an objective on a sticky note I'm going to do a hundred chord push-ups at this chord and you'll notice after you do that magically it gets better then we've got the next chord on measure 21 I consider that to be three, two, four, two. Um, that's third fret of the big string, and then second fret of the fourth string, fourth fret of the third string, and uh, second fret 
of the second string. So if I'm going to practice that chord, I'm just going to practice putting all of those in place like that and do that another hundred times or a thousand, whatever. The next chord in 22 is very similar to the one in 21. And we've got another run. Right around here, the, the phrasing sometimes can be a little bit counterintuitive. So slowly tap your way through it. Remember, this is almost strictly all 16th notes. So if you can tap your way through it, you can kind of be sure that you've got the right phrasing and you're, and you're emphasizing the right beats. That lick kind of starts on the second fret of the fourth string. So if I tap out there, I want to go da, 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 da. try to practice that way and kind of mentally know what's the contour of this thing in terms of you know if there's if it's comprised of of several smaller melodic pieces which where's the start of which and where's the end of which and that will kind of help me figure out where I want to place the emphasis and things like that. Now I've got a continuation of that run on measure 24. And on measure 25 we go straight to an open A chord. D chord and 26 so that whole thing is just a nice long melodic run great practice whether it's with the fingers or with the pick Remember to use some alternation and practice it slowly so you can kind of get a sense that, you know, if you, even if you just look at it on the page, whether in standard notation or in tab, you should see this kind of uh, beautiful shape to it. And uh, that's part of the, the symmetry of the music. So, so take note of it. Now we're in measure 29. Now we're in measure 30. I like to set that up so that the notes can kind of collide into each other a little bit because I've got the guitar. I'm, I'm, if you listen to it on cello, you can take note yourself. You know, did the did the player let some of these notes blend together, or was it all strictly one note at a time? But I think on the guitar, because we really don't have the sustain that the cello has, it's nice to create that illusion of a bigger sound by giving some notes some extra sustain. measure 31, here's where things get kind of um, almost avant-garde in a way. So we're going to make this jump in measure 31 up to the 7th fret after we do this little phrase here. So we're on the 2nd fret, maybe with the index finger of the 4th string. And you'll notice that halfway through beat 2 there's this open string on the high E string. And I'm definitely going to use that chance to jump. Right as I pluck that, I'm jumping. And I gotta make sure I land on seven. So anytime I'm working on any piece that's got a jump like this, I'm gonna plan out my jump. I'm gonna figure out, you know, what am I doing while I'm jumping? And I'm gonna practice doing it without looking at the guitar. It's not that I can't look at the guitar, it's just that I know I'm gonna be more reliable with that jump. If I can land right on the correct note. And a cool trick you can use if you're trying to practice a jump with your eyes closed, you can actually do it very, very slowly and feel your way up the frets. So I know I'm on the second fret, three is here, four, five, six. So when I bump into the seventh fret, I know I've hit the seventh fret. And sometimes I do that to practice uh, big position jumps without looking at the guitar. I just practice counting the number of frets. Sounds kind of crazy, but it does work in terms of um, helping me learn to feel the jump rather than, than see the jump because sometimes I'll miss it or sometimes I won't be looking at it. So it's just a, it's a good way to strengthen that ability to jump in, up and down the fretboard. Once we get to that 7, we're going to be droning this open E string. Now you want to have a, a good finger there, which I didn't in my demonstration, but you probably want to have your third finger on that 7th fret of the 4th string. kind of 
pivot a finger up to the seventh fret from the sixth fret of the third string, so you can kind of go back and forth that way. Or you can have your pinky go down there. So let's hear that again. So when you're playing multiple, uh, especially when you're repeating the same note like we are here on beat three of measure 33, you really want to use multiple fingers and you know let there be a clear difference between that. If you think about it, it's almost like using three different fingers would make the timbre of each of those three notes different. It does sound a little bit different. So now we've got this really weird idea starting on measure 34 and it kind of starts to use some chromatic notes. Not really sure what Bach was thinking there. Uh, definitely sounds a little bit unlike him, to my ears anyways. Starting in measure 36, things get even weirder. In measure 37, you'll see that I wrote a three above the seventh fret of the fourth string, indicating that I want you to use your third finger there. That just seemed like a good way to try to reach all of the notes that are about to be kind of alternated with this seventh fret note. It gets a little bit weird up here when we get to measure 38, but that was the only way I could figure out how to do it where I could keep the same exact finger on that fret. If you were doing the fingering on your own, you might decide to do something different, and that's fine. That's a, a very chromatic and, and certainly interesting idea. When we go back to measure 39, it gets a little bit more refreshing with these nice chords ringing out. I'm going to bar halfway across the 7th fret with my index finger, put my pinky on the 10th fret, and I'm just going to use that shape for measure 39. Now to get to measure 40, I'm just going to put my third finger on the 9th fret of the 3rd string. That's all I've got to do there. And then for measure 41, I'm going to let my pinky come down a half step to the 9th fret, and then I'm going to move uh, this finger up, this, uh, this third finger. Instead, I'm going to put my middle finger down on the 8th fret of the 2nd string. going to jump up to this D major chord here to end things off. So great tune, definitely very recognizable and pretty demanding for your technique with its combination of chord based structures and scale based structures. It's a really good uh, tune to build your guitar technique. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoy it.